phone went off, his alarm went off. And so he got it out and he said, oh, it's 10.02. I set it every day at, at 10.02. I set my alarm to remind me of Luke 10.2. So you guys know what that is, right? Okay, so let's look at there. Luke 10.2. Let's look that up. <clears throat> because this is something that you might want to do. I think it's a pretty, uh, actually it's a pretty neat thing. Luke 10.2. We're going to jump around quite a little bit in Scripture. So keep your Bible or your phone or whatever right, right handy. Luke 10.2 says this. This is Jesus speaking and He told them, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into His harvest. And so at 10.02 every day, and He got this from a missionary, He said, at 10.02 every day His alarm would go off and remind Him to pray for the workers to go out into the fields and share the gospel of Jesus Christ that's so needed. And so we stopped at that moment and we prayed. And it was really, and it was really, really cool. So I just wanted to share that with you and that's maybe something that you'll want to do. So what does compel us to go? What compels us? So we, Pastor Dusty and I went to Guatemala and we got back last week. If you weren't here, we shared just a little bit and shared some pictures and a few stories we're just going to wind that up today a little bit with his, uh, with the music, and I'll talk about a little bit at the very end. Um, but what compels us to go as believers in Jesus? What compels us to move out from our comfortable zone, right, you know, right here, right where we're at, and in our family, and to go out uh, to share the gospel, to love the nations? What draws us or causes us to go out? from what we're most used to doing, which is thinking about ourselves and our families and our communities, right? And then, and then Iowa. We have that progression, don't we? That's why most of you in here, if you're from Iowa, you're a Hawkeye fan or a Cyclone fan or a Panther fan or something, right? We, we stick around close to home, right? When we, even if we were to move away, we'd be rooting for West Fork to do well in sports, right? We, we, so what compels us to go out beyond ourselves and beyond our families, beyond our communities, to go out and into the world and share the gospel of Jesus, to love other people, to love the nations? What compels us? That's what I want us to talk about today. There's our, there are foundational shows and books and things as we grow up that literally changes our how we view things. A lot of times we'll watch a movie when we're young and it, it changes our view of, of life, right? Or love, or what a marriage looks like, or we'll read a book and it changes some things in our lives. Um, there was a, almost had a movie that almost had a cult following uh, several years back. It was about a young boy who moved from, not a young boy, but a, an older teenager who moved from New Jersey all the way to California. When he got to California, he began to get bullied and picked on. Anybody know what movie I'm talking about? Karate Kid. Karate Kid. I'm not talking about the new one. I'm talking about the old one, the original. Right? 1984, Karate Kid. Anybody? Wax on, wax off. All right. So, <clears throat> Daniel, is a, the boy, and his, his mentor became Mr. Miyagi, he taught him how to do karate, defensive moves in karate. And it, uh, so I wanna, the, the reason I bring that up is to, to take off on, on that idea of mentorship or teaching or discipleship. We call it discipleship in the church. Mentoring him. Now, so I want you to think about this. Um, Daniel didn't know any karate. And then he, gets, he asks this guy to teach him karate. So he begins and says, well, hey, yeah, start by waxing this, this car. Not just this car, but all these cars. And he had to do it in a particular way. It's like, you know, wax on, right? Wax off. And then paint. He couldn't just paint any old way. He had to paint, right, like this, and paint like this. And so what he was doing was he was teaching his, his muscles to, to react in a certain way. It wasn't about waxing the car and painting the fence. It was about teaching his muscles to react in a certain way. So this was defensive moves, right? Now, I'm not a karate expert, and I don't even want to do it, but 
Yeah, are you getting it? So that's, that's what he was doing. He was training him to react in a certain way. God does the same exact thing for us when it's with loving other people and interacting with other people. Because we don't know anything about love. That's what the Bible says. That's not what Pastor Ken says. That's what the Bible says. We read it in 1 John. 1 John 4 verse 10 and verse 19 reminds us that you didn't love until God loved you and He modeled for you what love was. So now love like God modeled for you and you mentor that from God and then you roll that out to other people. So he became Daniel, or as Mr. Miyagi called him, Daniel's son, right? Is that right, Jillian? Okay, she's a better expert at that movie than I am, apparently, but... Uh, here's what happened. He went from a novice to a champion. Oh! I just, I just ruined the ending for you. I'm sorry. Spoiler alert. Oh, wait a minute. It's 30 years old. If you haven't seen it by now, don't worry about it. He goes from being bullied to winning a championship. Um, okay, so anyway, it was a good movie. So, he was mentored by someone and he, and he learned. Our ability to show love, the love of God has to come from God Himself. That's what the Bible says. So here's a few scriptures. Turn to John chapter 13, if you would. John chapter 13. Danielson. <laughs> All you Danielsons. John chapter 13. All right, I'm going to quit. John 13, starting with verse 31. I'm going to, actually, I'm going to switch things around just a little bit, if you don't mind. Let's um, keep, let's mark that for a second. I'm going to go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's way over in the left in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you'll turn there. <clears throat> I think most of you are familiar with this. I think we've done a good job in the, in our church, if you're, if you've been part of our church to, um, we go into the Old Testament and we're reminded of the, the beauty of and the consistency between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so I just want to show you that real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 6, is, it's called the Shema. And if you're a Jewish person, you would know this, you would know this by heart. And um, God was rolling out this to His people. And He said, and he said this, uh, Daniel chap, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Listen, Israel, or hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words that I'm giving you today will, um, are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. All the things that you do. Think about this. The Lord is one Lord. And you should love the Lord with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength. And bind them as a sign on your hands, verse 8, and let them be as a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so the, the Jewish people took these very literally. If you've seen the pictures several months ago when we got back from Israel, we, ta we showed you pictures of the phylacteries, they're called. They're little boxes on the, uh, they put their way around their head and then on their wrist, and they have certain texts in them from the Old Testament. And uh, they think literally, I'm supposed to keep the Word of God. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about you know, keeping it in front of you, thinking about it at all times. Thinking about, well, you know, we did the bracelets. What would Jesus do? It's like a reminder. Hey, before I do something, how would God do this? How, what would Jesus do in this situation? What would He call for me to do? And so this, this system is for a, in a family for a father and a mother to teach, to mentor to disciple their kids as they, they grow up in the things of the Lord. Just like Mr. Miyagi did to Daniel, to, to train him and mentor him and disciple him. And that's what parents are supposed to do for their kids. And that's part of where the church tries to come along and help in that effort. Um, in Matthew chapter 22, 
Jesus kind of repeats this, doesn't He? Matthew chapter 22. Turn there, please. Matthew 22. We've looked at this several times, and I'll probably do it more and more because whenever somebody asks Jesus, "Hey, what's the most important commandment, or what's you know what's the most important thing we're supposed to do?" and He says something, and hey, we need to pay attention to it. So um, Jesus kind of put down the, uh, the the Pharisees came to Him, and they He had put down the Sadducees, and so the Pharisees got a guy that was. A, Involved in the law, really smart in the law. And he came to Jesus. Matthew twenty two thirty six said, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And so Jesus repeated the, the Shema. He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind or strength. And so that seemed pretty normal. That seemed pretty relevant. And this is the greatest and most important commandment, he said. But then he went on and he said, there's a second one like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And I know you've heard this several times, but I want you to remind yourself this morning that there's an order there. To love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I think the reason there's an order there is because you have to do the number one thing in order to do the second thing. You have to be in a love relationship with God in order to love and have compassion and reach out to people like you need to do. I've said it before, the, the, the quickest way that I know that I begin to drift a little bit off of the path I'm supposed to be on is I become really impatient, impatient, and I become nasty in my heart, and I even likable people, I don't like them very much. And I realize how quickly, if I don't love the Lord with all my heart, Ken drifts away and begins to get really nasty to other people. Is that okay to say that in here? And so immediately, you know how I know that I've not you know, been keeping track with God, maybe there's unconfessed sin, I haven't gotten the word like I'm supposed to or whatever, is because it's how I treat other people. It just, it's an instant thing with me. It's just something I constantly have to put down and surrender and submit to the Lord. And so I know immediately, if I'm, if I'm getting impatient with somebody, a driver, or what, it, what any circumstance, I'm like, oh man, I, I better fix number one. I better love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. Because I have to do that in order, in order to love and show compassion to people like I'm supposed to. And so that's an easy one for me. And, it's, and it bears out in 1 John 4, like I said, we've already read it. Verse 10 and 19 says... The reason you love is because God loved you. See, what God does is God comes in to our lives and He changes us, doesn't He? Through the gospel of Jesus Christ and we accept that free gift. And then he, the, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says He makes us a new creation. He changes us. The old has passed away. Behold, the, the new has come. Right? And he, he changes us. He makes us different. And, he, <coughs> and His love compels us to love others. Now, um, John 13 that I had you look at a minute ago. John 13, let's go there. This is an interesting one because it follows, in John 13, it follows the Last Supper and Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And so we know that tomorrow, like actually that night, He's going to get arrested and He's going to... Uh, go through the trials, and then tomorrow he'll be hanging on a cross. And so he's, he's doing the Last Supper and washing the disciples' feet. He calls out that, that someone's going to betray him, and we know it's Judas. And then he says this, starting with verse 31. John 13, 31. And when he had gone out, Jesus said, so this is all coming. So this is like, we know that tomorrow is he's going to be on the cross. So he's going to give them some... Final words. Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself, and will glorify Him at once. Children, I am with you a little while longer, and you will look at me, just as I told the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come, so now I tell you. Now listen, so what he's doing is saying, listen guys, I'm not going to be with you very much longer. So I'm going to tell you something. Would you pay attention right there? Three years of teaching and like, hey, I want to wrap it up. I want to give, I'm going to give you something. Here's what he says. 
I give you a new commandment. All right, all right, Jesus, let's, let's hear it. Boy, uh, so we've been watching you for three years and, and sitting under your teaching for three years, and now, you know, we, we, they didn't really understand it, but all right, we're going to get... We're going to get a morsel right here. A new command. What is it? Love one another. A new commandment. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love one another. You've been talking about that the whole time. So what, what's he saying? If I, if I could be so bold to say that the proper way, the, the, what this really means is he's saying, this, this, is a fresh, this is a fresh look at this commandment that I want to give you. Uh, you have been watching me for three years. You've been sitting under my teaching. You've watched me interact with people. You've watched me love people and heal people and, and teach people. You know what I'm about. Remember the, the widowed woman who was coming down the road with a... We know she was widowed and now she'd lost her adult son. So without a husband, without an adult son, there's no one to pr protect her and provide for. We saw that funeral procession, procession come down the road. We were doing our own thing. But I stopped and I had compassion on her. And I raised her son from the death. See, you've seen me. You've watched me interact and have compassion and love people. Now I want, I want to say it afresh. Love one another like I've loved. Like I've loved. Like you've watched me. Like I've mentored you. Like I've taught you and discipled you. Now go do the same with other people. We know the picture in Scripture, like I said, we're a new creation, right? The picture in, in Scripture of baptism is a, is a picture of that, right? Baptism illustrates us going into the water and, and what? Dying to ourselves. Dying to our own desires, our own, our own passions, our own pursuits. We die to ourselves. We come out of the water to live a new life for Christ. Right? It's an illustration of us dying to us and living for Him. That's kind of this fresh new look. Hey, I want to give you a fresh new look. Love one another. And this is how people are going to know that you're my disciples. Matthew chapter 25, if you'd turn there. Matthew 25, please. This will be, the la this will be where we'll end. We'll park it right here. Matthew 25, verse 31. So what, what compels us to love? What compels us to go? The love of the Father that we've seen. He first loved us, and so we love other people. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man... Who's that? Jesus. Jesus is talking, and He's talking about Himself. It says, When the Son of Man, Jesus, comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him... And He will sit on the throne of His glory and all the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. And then the king will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous kind of scratch their head a little bit and will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? I mean, I, hey, I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad I'm going to get to go into heaven. I, I'm glad that you're happy with me, but when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or when did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or without clothes and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, I assure you, whatever you did to the least of these my brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will also say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and the demons. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. 
And I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. And I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick in, a, in, in prison, and you didn't take care of me. And then they too. See, they'll, they'll, they're going to scratch their head too and say, whoa, 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 whoa. See, this is my words. Hey, Jesus, if we would have seen you, we would have done something about it. We never saw you in this circumstance. <coughs> Excuse me. And Jesus said, then they too will answer, Lord, we did not see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or in sick or in prison and, help, and not help you. And he will answer them, I assure you that whatever you did, to, did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me either. And they will go away into eternal punishment. But the, righteousness, the righteous will go into eternal life. Going into the world and being benevolent and being helpful and having a shoulder to cry on, and taking food and diapers and medicines and doing all those things are really, really important and needed and vital. But if we do not do them in the name of Jesus Christ and with the Gospel, well, this is how I put it to the team. When, they, when we were in Guatemala and we saw the, the, just the horrible... The, the poverty and the, the dump area. And you, walk, you literally walk through a cemetery to, to overlook the dump. And, and the, the, the cliffs are falling in. And so some of the tombs on the outside have fallen in. And a lot of them are broken into. You know, people have um, you know, tried to get teeth out of them or jewelry or whatever. They've destroyed them. Sometimes they don't pay their rent, so they pull the casket out and throw it over the hill. And it's an emotionally difficult time. And so I talked to the team after that, and I just said in our debrief session, I just reminded them, if we brought in semi-loads of diapers and clothes and food and everything, and, and then we, we somehow were able to close down the dump and had $10 million to start a factory where they made cotton balls, white cotton balls. And, and you know, the, the walls are all white and it's clean and it's just beautiful in there. And we don't share the gospel. And all we're doing is making the world a nicer place to go to hell from. And so doing all these things without the gospel is just making the world nicer. But people are still on their way to hell. And so that's important to keep. So what compels us to go? What compels us to share the gospel? So this is why, this is why Pastor Dusty and I went to Guatemala. Went to believe Guatemala. Because I knew they were doing great things. I knew they'd build a restoration center. I knew they were de delivering things. And we'd go, we went to two orphanages. And we went to Christian schools. And we, I mean, we, we were doing great things. But what I wanted to know was, is it in the name of Jesus and is the gospel being proclaimed? And so there were several occasions that, um, that we got to see. The guy that heads it up, Joel Juarez, we got to see him. Just we, we opened up a door for him to share the gospel and boom, man, he was on it. He was excited, he was vibrant, that's what he lit up for. And so he didn't know that that's why we were going. But I can walk away saying I've seen several times when the door opened and he just went ferociously in there with the gospel. And so that's why I'm so excited about what they're doing at Believe Guatemala. <clears throat> Are you compelled to go? Are you compelled to love as God loved? Are you compelled to share the gospel? What is the gospel? Do you know the gospel? Do you know the gospel well enough to share it if somebody asks? The, the gospel doesn't start with us. The gospel starts with God. For God so loved. See, it starts with Him. So God loved and God sent Jesus. Jesus came. He was a real man. He came. He lived the perfect life. He died on a cross. He was buried in the ground. The Bible says it's all part of the gospel. He was buried... So we know he was dead, and he rose again. If God was pleased by what happened to him, rose him from the dead, and if we accept the gift that Jesus gave us on the cross by dying for our sins, we will have 
uh, life eternal. If we follow Him, we'll, we're one of His children. And He calls us and He loves us and He'll provide a home for us. Now, that's the gospel. You can do it longer. You can do it a little shorter. Those are the key elements. But you have to know that. You have to love people enough to share the gospel with them. Do you love people? And are you willing to share? On our mission trip, let me close like this. On our, on our mission trip, we, um, I, don't, I don't think we talked about getting stuck in Atlanta. Um, so here's what happened. We fly out of, we're supposed to fly out of Des Moines to Atlanta, then Atlanta to Guatemala, and everybody's excited. We're going to land in Guatemala, and we're going to start our mission trip, right? We're on mission. Woo! Guatemala, here we come. So what happens in Des Moines is we back away, we back away. Good job, Delta. You got us off on time. Awesome. We pull out. And then there's some weather between here and, and Atlanta. So they're saying, hmm, okay, let's think about this. Uh, we're going to have to go a little out of the way. Uh-oh, we don't have enough fuel. So, sorry folks, we've been sitting here for half an hour figuring out we don't have enough fuel. So we're going to come back up to the, you know, uh, uh, up back up where we started from a half an hour ago. We'd gone about 50 feet. That was a good job. And then we came back up. And then we had to wait for the people to figure out how much fuel we needed to get, you know, just a little bit around the weather. And then for them to order that from some powers that be somewhere. And then for those powers that be somewhere to tell the people with the fuel to fuel the plane and all that, right? So we had a, about an hour, 45 minute layover in Atlanta that was getting eaten up by them figuring out that we need a little more fuel. We landed in Atlanta basically exactly at the time when we were supposed to be taking off from Atlanta. So guess what? 15 people, they didn't hold the plane. I wish they kind of would have because it's kind of one of those, it's a terminate, like, it's one of those places you go to Guatemala City and the, the plane's not going to go anywhere for a while. So I'm not sure why they didn't wait, but they didn't wait. And God's in charge of all things, so that's, that's cool. But, so we, we literally r ran, and it, it was, the plane was gone. And they're like, hey, there's another plane to Guatemala City. It's, it's like in G45 you know, or whatever. So we, sent, we grabbed David's bag, and we sent David. You know, David's running, and the plane was gone. Oh, there's another one to Guatemala City, which I'm like, how many planes go to Guatemala City? But anyway, so we went to, way over to another place. And it was already gone. And so we hiked, and we just, we just laid out all around the help center, the Delta help center. And they probably weren't very happy about that because it's like, need assistance? You know, come here. All right, we did. So we just, we were all sitting around, like hanging out. And so they felt sorry for us, so they brought us some pop, and they brought us some crackers and stuff like this. And we just kept hanging out there for a while. And, and um, they don't give you a hotel because... Of weather, it's that's that's you know an act of God. That's not our fault, even though we couldn't figure out we needed a little more fuel and just put the fuel in. But anyway, okay. So I'm not bitter. No, 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 really. I'm, I'm really not because because I was praying this whole time. Seriously, I I was praying this whole time. Like I I didn't really want to leave my wife as I got closer and closer. Anybody like, hey, that sounds like a great idea. And then it's like, oh, I don't really want, what you know what happens. I don't you know I don't I don't want to I didn't want to leave. But anyway, so. Um, so I'm like, okay, God, you're in charge of all this. I'm just going to relax. And I was. I was just, I was relaxed. I was, it was all good for me. I was just, I was enjoying the moment. And um, so then they come back. After we booked hotel rooms, they came, and they, I think because we stayed there for so long in front of their help center, that they decided to give us six rooms, 15 of us. They gave us six rooms at a hotel. So we, um, that was kind of cool. So we uh, went to this hotel and um, near the airport, and we didn't, so now, so we're hang, hanging out, let's meet for supper in a little while. And of course, we didn't want to eat in the hotel, because that would be just too normal. So let's, let's look for a restaurant on our phone, and let's walk there. So we start walking, and we should have known right away, because the first restaurant, it's like, there's, there's nothing there. All right, well, let's keep walking. The next one, we, we're like, oh, that's across the street right there. That's, that's all boarded up. That's not open anymore. And so we kept walking, and actually there was a guy that came by, uh, came by us and, and said, because uh, they were all black. Everybody was black, which is just part of the story. So he says, oh, it, he yells across the street, oh, it's getting kind of colorful around here. Who's talking about us? Can you imagine that? So, 
So we weren't smart enough to know any different, so we kept going. And um, we're, you know, there's, hey, there's another restaurant just way up here. And um, it was, you know, it was a little sketchy, but it was fine. We were, and so, and pretty soon this, uh, this car pulls up, and it's an off-duty police officer, and he waves one of the guys over, and he says, uh, what are you guys doing? <laughs> oh, we're just going to go, we're going up here. He goes, turn around. Turn around. Okay. <laughs> um, so as we're turning around, there was one of the uh, young black guys that came, across, ran across the street, and got in the front of us. So we're all walking down the sidewalk, and he actually got in front of us, held up his phone, took a video, and hey, look who's in my neighborhood! So we're all on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So it was really cool. So. We went back, uh, we, so we went back. Now, it was Dusty and I and then 13 people, well, I, we knew David, but 13 people we didn't know very well. Um, so we sat down in this restaurant, we had um, two, two waitresses, they were, they were black. And the conversation began about, about what we had just experienced. And I wanted to make sure we didn't go down a road that, that wasn't Christ-honoring. I mean, look, we're being helped by these two black ladies that are doing an amazing job for a large group of us. And, I, and we, were, you know, we were safe. Let's, let's make sure the conversation doesn't get out of control and go beyond what God would be honored by. So, um, we, we, you know, I, we mentioned a few things. Anyway, the, these two ladies took our, all of our orders and they got, uh, when they got, they went around the tables, I think this way, and they got done, they were right by by me, so I, I said to them, we asked them their name, Do you, it was, one was Kia, and she was a younger girl that was pregnant, and then the, an, another one, and they were just, they were funny, they were, you know, they were awesome waitresses, and I said, hey, and I do this uh, quite often, I said, hey, we're getting ready to pray for our meal, um, is there anything that we can pray for you about while we, while we pray? And she did two things that I've never had anybody in all the times I've done that, she, had, she did two things. First, she said, well, who are you? Are you praying in the name of Jesus Christ? I, the older one did. I said, well, yes, we are. And so then we talked. We told her why we were there. We were on a mission group, mission team and all that. So, um, so they just asked to pray for strength and stuff to get through life and that God would be with them and things like that. Um, and here's the other thing they did that I've never had happen as many times as I've, as I've done this, um, I said, when they, after they got done, usually the waitresses always leave, and then we pray. They stood by me, and we prayed for these two ladies. And they're amen and yeah, thank you, Lord, and all this. And it was awesome. Right? And so some of our team was frustrated because we're, hey, we're stuck in Atlanta. We want to be on mission. We want to get to Guatemala. And we're like, we're, we're on mission. We're on mission. A sovereign God that's in charge of the thunderstorms put us in Atlanta that night. And we were on mission. When you walk out these doors, you're on mission. God calls us to love. And God calls us to share the gospel. I remember when we first came to First Baptist Church, they had a sign that over the door. It said, you're now entering the mission field. When you go outside of the building, you're now entering the mission field. You're on mission, folks. You're on mission. Let's, let's pray together. Father God, would you, would you give us the strength, Lord, to, to love as you love? And we have to be anchored in, in your love, Father God, we have, to be, uh, we have to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, so that we can love other people like you would have us to love other people and to have compassion on other people and to give. Help us to be open-handed, Father God. An open-handed people that you've blessed us so much, Lord. Help us to just give freely of what you've blessed us with. And help us to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Thank you, Father, that it begins with you.
was redeemed through the cross and the empty tomb. And we love you, Father God. We know that you are reigning and ruling over all things. And so as you open doors, Father, help us not to be looking um, looking around, but to take that open door and walk through it and give you glory. We love you. And in Jesus, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.